Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you, Arkiva, for hosting the event. Uh, very nice to meet you all. Thanks for coming down, spending a little bit of time. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a customer engineer at Google Cloud. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about. It's, it's not a pitch. It's important that you know uh, the the organisers wanted something technical and not pitching products. Uh, it's just something I'm interested in, and I. Uh, and it's, it's the Google network. So God, when I got there, I was like, oh, wow, let's, let's find out how this network works for media delivery. My background's in media, mostly in the OTT side of video, but you know, touching on OTT services for broadcasters and pay TV operators. So roughly familiar with the, some of the challenges that were being mentioned earlier. But I'm a bit more in the kind of OTT digital end of it. So the network and the off-net caches is more about the HTTP streaming, HLS, Dash, that kind of stuff, and at scale. So um, as I kind of went through you know, various stuff, I, I found myself referring to a couple of uh, interesting uh, white papers, um, uh, one of them an article and one of them a white paper uh, that I just referenced quite a lot. So yeah, I just, I just want to talk about what, what these people have found in their study when they've studied off-net caches and, 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 and peering topology. Uh, so there's two papers. One is called Seven Years in the Life of Hypergiant Offnet. So Hypergiant, not a word I'd necessarily use, but that's the name of the paper. Offnet, uh, I'll probably go into a bit more detail, but that is when a, an operator like uh, Google or um, uh, Akamai is one of the other examples, they have their own network. And then when they have caches which are not on their own network and they're off, off the network, they're off net, they're deep inside the ISP caches. And the, the study was looking at how they've grown over the years. So, uh, and the second one is hierarchy free reachability, which is an, another kind of, it's a sort of a, a networking topic. And it's um, how, the, how the reach of the big delivery networks has changed over the years. And these are people who just study delivery. So we'll have a look at those papers. Um, so what I will say is the material in the deck is uh, and the information is based on two published research papers. Now I'll, I'll, I'll go into the, the details of uh, who they're by, uh, Peter, uh, Petros uh, Gigis and Todd Arnold. Um, and it's not an official Google point of view. So I'm, when I say that this, it's the paper says this. It's not necessarily what Google is saying. Just a little bit of a disclaimer there uh, that this is a, you know, a tech, a tech meetup about what white papers say about the Google network. This isn't Google saying about the Google network. Hope that's okay. Uh, so I'll dive straight in. Uh, the first paper is Seven Years in the Life of Hypergiant Offnets. It's article by Pedros Gigis. He's a PhD student in computer science at the University College London, published on Ripe Labs um, uh, in March 2022. So look up Ripe Labs. You'll find the paper. You'll find the comments in there. There's uh, lots of references to lots of the data and how it was all put together. I've just taken a few summary points out of it. So. We'll go into this in detail in a little bit. This is the, you know, one of the important charts out of it, and it's uh, where it's there. This is uh, you know, uh, labs.ripe if you want to go have a look. As I mentioned, it's uh, Pedros Gigis. So the article is, uh, what they present is a methodology, a methodology to measure the expansion of hypergiants and other networks and their hypergiant offnets. So again, not my language from the paper. Um, how they have, um, how these large, the top, Top, the biggest four off-net networks, Netflix, of course, being one of them in the, in the video space, uh, and Google, of course, being one of them, largely a YouTube-driven um, uh, off-net cache, um, how they've expanded and how they've measured it. They did it through a series of things. There's a whole vast amount of data you can download for all the SSL certificates in use. They can look up the, the, the operator's uh, 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 autonomous system number. They can map what IP addresses. Um, uh, are, are on the uh, uh, are on the cus uh, on the on the operator's network and where these SSL certificates exist off of off the network. That's the term off net. That's a very crude, brief discussion of how they did their measurement, but it's quite accurate. And they did like lots of cross checking, and it's all gone into detail. We won't go into that, but we'll we'll look at the results of what was there. But you can go and see it, and all the data is there. They make it available, and the software is available on GitHub, so it's quite nice. Uh, so the growth, uh, the the study was from 2013 to 2021, so seven, eight years, something like that. Okay. So this is the chart that's interesting, the longitudinal expansion of these off-net caches by major hypergiants. And I'll get onto a little bit about the Google-specific off-net cache and how we've brought that out as a product um, that is accessible for media customers. So um, this chart depicts the evolution of the number of autonomous systems that host off-nets by Google, Facebook, Akamai, and Netflix. So Google, Facebook, Akamai, Netflix. I'm sorry, it's a bit small. 
So in 2013, Google ha operated Offnet in 1,044 ASs. That's about there, 2013, Google's the red bar. By 2021, it had Offnet servers in 3,810 ASs. When we say in an AS, it typically means in an ISP that has an autonomous system network, so it has an AS number. So that was the growth of the Google one. Our study, uh, their study, not my study, their study, captured the birth and the rapid expansion of Offnet deployments by Netflix and Facebook. Now, we probably, many of us know that Netflix have a significant Offnet network and they have their Open Connect strategy where they do peering and then they'll ship you a box, BSD, loads of disks. It's an Offnet cache, it's not the Netflix cache. Refreshes overnight, marvelous situation, and then delivers loads of VOD over uh, ISP networks. You know, probably seven, eight years ago, Sandvine in North America was quoting that 30 or 40% of downstream US traffic in an evening is Netflix traffic. And they achieved that through their, the growth and birth of their Offnet cache. Interestingly, Facebook have a massive Offnet cache. I didn't actually know that, but it's there, it's in the measurement. It's things like Instagram and all your media in WhatsApp and the big WhatsApp group. So they, they have this large Offnet cache as well. Uh, so it, 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 it tracked the birth of those. And uh, for two years, I'll uh, just comment on this, Netflix Offnets were uh, serving content with HTTP only. So their data, because it used the SNI 7M invocation in the SSL certificate, they couldn't quite tell, but they made a prediction of what it actually looked like. Um, uh, despite the footprint, uh, despite this, the Netflix footprint continues to grow. And in April 2021, had Offnets in roughly 2,200 ASs. So um, those four operators account for a lot of the downstream traffic. Um, so oh, we must have Akamai in there somewhere. Green. Uh, no comment on there so far. Overall, Facebook and Netflix seem to mirror Google, but lag by a few years. I didn't say it. I quite liked it, but that's what it says. <laughs> uh, but, um, on the other hand, Akamai seems to be pursuing a different strategy, interestingly, as the off-net footprint reached a plateau in 2017 and since started to decline. So if you look into the paper, they sort of, I think, you know, to, to be fair, Akamai is obviously a world-class delivery network. I think they reduced the off-nets in what were, what were known as stub ASs, they were very small ASs where there, there wasn't much of an audience coverage. Uh, so yeah, not to take away from the Akamai network. This isn't obviously all data, it doesn't measure capacity, it just measures number of locations where off-nets exist. So it's not all encompassing. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, that's the, is that the high level on that? Yeah, no, that's that, that, that's that piece basically. The reason I kind of, started uh, citing this because um, without you know pitching uh, to, uh, too much but in March um, Google Cloud made um, a product available called media CDN which is the product of uh, the Google global cache so what happened so roughly about then um, as Google expanded the and YouTube traffic uh, expanded uh, Google started placing off nets in all the ISP networks that was delivering all the YouTube, a lot of the popular YouTube con uh, uh, traffic uh, content. I say popular because a lot still comes from the core network, but the popular stuff comes from the offnets or the external caches, as we call it. Um, Chrome downloads, billion users. You Chrome download, everyone gets the same piece of large binary object. Uh, Google Play APKs. So if anyone uses Android, you download an APK from the Google Play Store. All comes from the offnets. So. Um, that's been around for a long time, delivering those core parts for Google. The Google network was, uh, is Google Cloud runs on the Google network, but we made the, the Google Global Cache, as it's known, available as Media CDN. So it's fairly complicated to use because it was originally uh, built for YouTube and these other things. But it's, uh, it's Envoy, I can, I can probably share with you. We took the infrastructure that was already in place. We used Envoy proxy caches at the, what we call the external cache. And then we have a, an equivalent of what, uh, at the Google Edge, which is um, like a Midgres cache. And then we have the, what's called a long tail cache, which is inside a Google data center. So it's a three tiered cache. Uh, and that came around in, in March. So um, yeah. I'll, I can take questions on that one now, or we can take questions at the end. You got preference? I'll keep going, and then we'll, uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll take a few questions at the end. The other paper, hang on, the wrong way. I need to go that way. <laughs> uh, is related, uh, but it's not the offnet. It's the hi what's called hierarchy-free reachability. It's a research paper by a guy called Todd Arnold. Um, I'm 
I mean, it should be able to read all of the names, but I can't. But I do know Ethan Katz Bassett was also a contributor to the previous paper. So I looked up all these people and they just basically do internet measurement. This was presented at the 2020 Internet Measurement Conference in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was in the middle of COVID 2020, I guess. So it was online at the time. So you can catch the video. The link will be down there somewhere. Um, so this is interesting. The tier one ISPs were originally considered the internet's backbone since the dawn of the modern internet 30 years ago. Tier ones could basically reach anywhere on the internet and they all exchange traffic with each other. Uh, and they are, um, uh, yeah, uh, there's a handful of tier one ISPs. And they guaranteed global reachability. If you get to a tier one, you can get anywhere. However, their influence and importance are waning as internet flattening decreases the demand for transit services and increases the importance of private interconnect. Now I'll go into how that relates to us in a moment. In this paper we seek to quantify the extent to which the cloud providers can bypass the tier ones and, uh, and other large transit providers. We can conduct a comprehensive measurement to identify the neighbor networks of the major cloud providers and combine them with the AS relationship inferences to model the internet AS level topology to calculate a new metric, hierarchy free reachability, which characterizes the reachability your network can use without traversing networks of the tier one and tier two ISPs. So what that means is uh, traditionally you buy bandwidth from your uh, uh, ISP, uh, your local ISP, who would get it from probably a tier two or possibly a tier one ISP as well. And that would give you access to the whole internet. Um, and Google progressively more and more um, uh, as they were shipping lots of traffic to the ISPs, they said, hey, you can come peer with us. If you go look up peering.google.com, you'll see what it, what's required to peer with Google, be present in one of the big locations where all the exchanges take place and have uh, 10 gig ports and um, ASNs and manage BGP and you can peer with Google. And all the ISPs do that because it's in their interest so they don't have to buy their, their upstream bandwidth to get to Google where a bunch of traffic's coming from. So hope, hopefully that, so that's the study and how that relates to Google and Google Cloud CDN and, and how we feed our Edge CDN will hopefully become a little bit clearer in a little bit. So. Um, this is the chart that uh, uh, it illustrates uh, the cloud providers bypassing the transit. So the most connected network on the planet, we'll see it stack ranked on the next slide, is level three, uh, these days known as um, Lumens. Um, so the, the tier one ISPs are in red, so they all reach the top. The top is uh, 69,488 autonomous <laughs> systems, that's the current number of ASs that put together the, what's known as the internet. And in red, tier ones can reach the top. And then the second most connected network is an interesting one that I hadn't actually heard of called Hurricane Electric, Tier 2 ISP. Uh, and it goes into how they got such incredibly large reach, but without being so well known. And what they did, they just went into all the exchanges where you just get a single port on the exchange. So it doesn't give you loads of capacity, but it gives you access to lots of ASNs. And then they exchange BGP routes with all of the different ISPs that are in the exchange. So they're pretty high up there. And then Google comes in third and also reaches there is, must be a slither in the top, but it's not shown on the graph. Nearly all of the um, 69,000-odd uh, ASs that make up the internet. So what that means is, um, normally when a request comes to Google, 98% of the traffic we hand off directly to the ASN that requested it. We don't use a Tier 1 or a Tier 2, tier two upstream ISP. So what it basically means is the user gets a good experience, ISP gets uh, settlement free peering uh, and we get good access uh, to deliver the traffic. So this was their study and uh, you know it's uh, how, how do I put it but like um, you know we, we, we never ignore the other cloud providers of course Amazon is out there brilliant platform Azure doing well brilliant ex brilliant execution all our customers are using you know so it's, it's hard to find someone who's not using one of them um, and it's just nice to be ahead in, in one area, which is the network. So I think it's like a, you know, it, I, the, the network is driven by a, a huge amount of demand, which is something those other cloud providers don't have in the same way that Google has. So I really like the network. I think it's fun. I think it's interesting. And you get access to a great network. Uh, the other ones in it, Microsoft is a very highly peered network, it seems. Uh, uh, IBM and then uh, the other guys are in there. Uh, surprisingly, Telin. Uh, oh, no, Telin is somewhere there. PCCW from uh, Hong Kong. Um, NTT Japanese and uh, Amazon is in there as well. 
Um, so tier ones have the maximum possible reach, as we see. Tier one providers are shown in red, and their reach is the top. All of them, 69,488 ASs. And cloud providers are shown in blue, and there's only 174 networks that Google cannot reach when it bypasses its transit providers. So there's 174 ASs out there that we need to go to an upstream ISP. And we have a few upstream ISPs, but generally, we run our own network. I didn't put in all the Google slides, which show all our pops and our network. We have a load of that. You've hopefully maybe seen it. <laughs> but it's a big network, um, and, uh, uh, but we largely traverse our own network and then hand off traffic directly to the ISP. So it's, it's just at least a good video experience. Hopefully, hopefully that point's not lost, that this is about delivering uh, large, large bits of data, commonly video. And um, that's the stack ranked. Oh, I changed it. I had the 2015 chart before, but the 2020 chart is uh, up there. Uh, Google comes in at number three. It's 86.9% of the ASs. Now, I did say 98% of our traffic is direct handoff. The difference there is uh, there's uh, obviously a certain number of ASs that don't generate a lot of demand. So basically, probably non-ISP networks. And uh, Amazon's down there in 18, doing pretty well, though, because the 2015 chart, they were down like in 350. So they've been growing a lot. The paper's not about who's where, it's about how the, the big cloud providers have crept into what was formerly tier one ISP territory. Tier ones do settlement free peering. You know, when, when Google showed up and said, hey, can we do 10 gigs with you? They were like, no, <laughs> when were you an ISP? But these, these days, the, the big cloud providers, cause they, and uh, there's so much demand for this stuff, they managed to get a lot of settlement free peering in there. And that's it. I don't know if I went way over time or not. I can probably take a couple of questions, can I? Any questions? No questions? Oh, there's one at the front. OK. Yeah. So I'm, I'm intrigued as to where there are costs involved in that, for that peering to happen. Settlement free peering. So that, that settlement free means there's no exchange of money. It's free. Right. So we're, we're all just we're playing nicely together. Um, what ISPs and uh, Google and yes. places? Uh, it's mutual interest. Yeah. Uh, if so, what happens if we want to reach people on the ISP network and the ISP people on the ISP network want to um, uh, reach Google, um, and it's the interest of both to do? And what it is, it mentions it in there, and, and it's on peering.google.com that you know these are the requirements. It's technical requirements only, and it's and there's no cost involved. Uh, so uh, yeah, if so you, just the cost of that 10 gig link, and then you're in. Yeah, cross connect in the data center. Yeah. And and uh, you know, and there are hundreds and hundreds of ten gig links. And hundred gig links. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so there's a standards initiative underway under the streaming video alliance called Open Caching. Oh yes, yes. Have you uh, heard of it and what's Google's position on it? Uh, I have heard of it. I probably couldn't comment on Google's position on it. But when I wh if when you can't I comment on your position on it. Who in Google is the representative on the forum? Well, I, I, I tell you what I thought when I read it, uh, open caching standard, I'm like, there is a standard. It is an RFC, and it was originally in HTTP, and it's now been moved out, and it's called the caching RFC. That's open caching. All the, and like, if you use, ever use Google Cloud CDN, it followed RFC 100%. And everyone was coming from the other CDN and saying, oh, but how can we do this, and how can we force this, and override that, and negative cache this. And do. None of them are standards, RFC standards. They are features that are added to caching. Trying to make them RFC, though. Okay, but currently the, uh, there is an RFC <laughs> which has worked for a very long time, uh, and it's like, yeah. But that, I, 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 you know, because lots of people do say, oh, uh, they want all these features, and Google initially Google Cloud literally only divorced in the RFC. Like you couldn't do an override and say cache images and JPEGs, and they're like, well, how can you? How come you can't do that? And it's like, um, well, you set the headers on the origin. Like, how else would you do it? Uh, and, that, and that's how all the Google services have all been built to f follow the RFC and use completely open standards. There's nothing proprietary in the way any of the Google caches work. Only the features that we've kind of brought to kind of bring us into line with the, the uh, other CDN vendors. But so I don't know the Google official position on that, but uh, I just find it interesting that there's always been a uh, HTTP caching standard and it's been pretty similar for a long time as well. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Cool. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh,